What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. Before I dive into today's video, I have a couple of fun things to talk to you guys about. I will be at CrimeCon 2020 again this year. I am so excited, you guys. You don't even understand. CrimeCon has been so much fun for me, not only because it's the only place I've really been able to meet a lot of you guys, but I've been able to meet a lot of other content creators. I always go with John Lorden. It's the only time of year that we get to see each other. He's another true crime YouTuber. He also co-hosts the podcast Crime After Crime with me. There's a lot of fun panels. If you don't know what CrimeCon is, it's exactly as it sounds. It's a crime centered convention, basically. There's a lot of podcasters that are there. Um, Oxygen hosts it. It's tons of panels, tons of live podcasting streams. There was a PI experience last year. I don't know what's happening with that situation this year. Uh, it's just a lot of fun, very informative, educational, and you get to meet a lot of really cool people that are very like-minded. So if you guys want to get a discount on tickets, you can use John and I's code crime after 2020. Honestly, you guys, it's been so much fun. Every time I've went last year, I was at a bar sitting, staring at David Rudolph from across the bar and I like could not bring myself to go and talk to him. Um, but it's just interesting. You get to see a lot, a lot of people there. Now, the second announcement is that the associate producer of Without Wax, which is the documentary that was made by the students um, on the Skelton Brothers disappearance, he actually reached out to me before I was able to reach out to him and he said that you guys flooded all of their sites after I mentioned their documentary, which makes me so incredibly happy. You guys did so much for them and so much for this case. He told me that they are planning on doing more screenings. He doesn't have any details solid yet, so I'm sure I'll hopefully get that information when he does and I'll be able to share it with you guys. They're submitting the film to many different film festivals across the country. They're hoping to get the attention of maybe Netflix or Hulu, which could be huge for this case, especially because there is a chance these boys are out there alive somewhere and the right person just needs the information. What better way to raise exposure than by blasting this documentary all over Netflix? So thank you guys so much for supporting my video and then going and supporting those that made the documentary without wax. Hopefully some of us will be able to get to see it and hopefully we're able to help them push towards Netflix and Hulu so there can be more tips brought in, more exposure because that is what it's all about. So now I'm going to go ahead after all that rambling and get into today's video. So today's video is kind of like a two-part video a little bit. I don't know how to describe it. I've never done anything like this before. Today I'll be speaking about the unsolved murder of Amanda Tusing, but it's very possible and authorities believe there could be a connection to another murder, the unsolved murder of Dana Steidem. I think I'm pronouncing both of their last names right. So I'll be covering Amanda this week today, obviously, and then next Saturday I'll be covering Dana Steidem and you guys can kind of see what you think at the end of it. The way this all happened was very fascinating. I was only looking into Amanda Tusing, and then I stumbled across another woman named Annette Rapaley. Oh, I know I'm butchering that name probably. Um, I stumbled across that name and it was a shooting in 2013 and it somehow tied into the unsolved murder of Dana, which happened in 1989, which then they somehow connected possibly to Amanda's murder in 2000. So it's pretty crazy how it all works out and I'm interested to see what you guys think because there's this whole idea of a potential serial killer in Arkansas and these could be victims. So let's just get started on Amanda. Amanda was born on December 6, 1979 to Ed and Susan Tusing. She was a very sweet, very smart little girl. She loved animals. She loved her family. She had two brothers and one of them she was especially close with because it was her twin. She was described as the kind of person that always had a smile on her face. She was never upset. She was always happy, easygoing, down to earth, the life of the party. Everyone was able to get along with Amanda. Prior to her death, her life was flourishing. She was 21 years old at the time and she was dating a guy named Matt and just months prior, they had gotten engaged and she was so excited to start planning out not just that, but the rest of her life. You could constantly find her looking at wedding magazines. But on the night of July 14th, 2000 into the early morning hours of July 15th, 2000, someone took that from her. The night of June 14th, Amanda had spent some time with Matt at his apartment in Jonesboro, Arkansas. She was not from Jonesboro, Arkansas. She did not live with him yet. I believe he lived alone in his apartment, but she lived about 40 miles away in Dell, Arkansas and her parents' house. At about 11.30 that night, Dana decided to head back to Dell and this wasn't 
a trip she wasn't familiar with. It was mainly highway. Jonesboro is kind of this really big city and then the highway she would have taken is basically just through farmland. There's absolutely nothing. She would have passed through like maybe two or three small towns um, and it should have taken about an hour for her to get from Jonesboro to Dell, but it had been storming really, really bad that night. So Matt was a little bit on edge about her leaving and driving back home, but it's what she wanted to do. So he just told her to make sure that she called him when she got back. She did have a cell phone, but it was almost always dead. So he just wanted to, I guess, touch on all the bases to make sure she would be safe. Two hours passed and Amanda had not called Matt yet. And he thought, you know, maybe she fell asleep and she forgot to call me. Maybe she did make it home safe, but he was so unsettled by this that he decided to call her parents at the home phone instead, just to make sure. So it was about 1.30 AM when Matt called Amanda's home and Amanda's mother answered the phone. And he explained the situation that Amanda was supposed to be home probably by like 12.30 that she was supposed to call him and she hadn't yet. So Amanda's mom went to go check her bedroom to make sure that she had made it home safe, but Amanda was not in bed. And when she looked outside, Amanda's car also was not there. Amanda's father, Ed, jumped into the car right away to head down Highway 18 from Dell towards Jonesboro. And Matt jumped in his car to head down Highway 18 from Jonesboro towards Dell. So they were both kind of traveling towards each other. And at this point, everyone was thinking she had car trouble. Maybe she ran out of gas. Maybe she got a flat tire. Maybe the rain was too bad and she had to pull over. Or maybe she hydroplaned and it was farmland, so there might not have been anyone there to help her. So they're genuinely believing she was fine, she just was stuck on the side of the road. Around 2.30 a.m., Matt ended up finding Amanda's Pontiac Grand Am parked on the side of Highway 18, and it was about five miles east of the St. Francis Bridge, a point that was roughly about halfway between his house and home. It wasn't even really necessarily in the middle of nowhere. The car was parked in an area that was surrounded by houses and it was parked directly under a street light. So the situation did seem like she may have just had some sort of car issues, but she didn't seem to be at the car. So Matt ended up meeting Ed somewhere else and then showed him to the location of Amanda's vehicle. Right off the bat, they noticed from inspecting the car further that this was not right. Something was very, very off. The keys were still in the ignition. The car was not on, but the keys were definitely still there and her cell phone was in the passenger seat dead. The windshield wipers appeared to have stopped mid-swipe, almost as if she turned the car off in a hurry before turning off the wipers. If something had happened and she needed to go get help or go get gas, it was weird that she didn't take her keys with her. Granted, her phone was dead, but it was still odd that she would just leave it sitting open in the seat. Turn the car on to see if there was anything wrong with it and the car was completely fine. The battery wasn't dead, there was plenty of gas in the car, the radio was still turned on to her favorite station. It didn't make any sense. Matt also noticed that there was a Coke can sitting in the cup holder of the car. It was about halfway full and it was still frosted, which he knew she hadn't left his house with. It's not all too strange. She could have stopped at a gas station to get it, but keep in mind, it was the middle of Arkansas in the summer. She had left his house at about 11.30. It had taken her until about 12 probably to get to this location. It's now 2.30 and this Coke is still cold. It threw a lot into speculation. But despite all of these things being left behind, there was still absolutely no sign of Amanda. Ed and Matt called authorities to alert them that Amanda was missing and they immediately showed up on the scene. There were only a handful of other items in the car, but they weren't all too significant. There was a wedding magazine. We know why she had that. I believe there was a soccer ball or a basketball or something like that, but not much physical evidence or really anything at all suggesting that a struggle had happened in the car was found. They processed the vehicle further and they were able to find that there were partial fingerprints in the vehicle, but they were unidentifiable. It just wasn't enough for them to get a hit on anything. And I also know that they took a few hairs from the car but that was pretty much all they had to go off of. Authorities at this point didn't even believe someone else had been in the vehicle. It just appeared as if she, for some reason, got out of it and vanished. The searches began for Amanda, but they stopped pretty much as quick as they had started. Three days after her car was found, so was her body. A hunter was out hunting squirrels in an area known as Big Bay Ditch, which was about 12 to 14-ish miles away I think west from where her car was found. So back towards Jonesboro, essentially. 
Because of the rain, the ditch was completely filled with water and the hunter was passing by and noticed a body. When the hunter called authorities, authorities pretty much knew exactly who this body belonged to. When they arrived, they were attempting to assess the situation as best as they possibly could. Amanda didn't appear to have any trauma at all to her body. There was no obvious evidence of stab wounds or gunshot wounds or even scratches or anything. So she was sent for an autopsy to figure out what on earth happened to her. Medical examiner couldn't find any sign of a sexual assault or even a cause of death at all. Authorities right off the bat believed this was foul play because the chances of her leaving her car in the middle of the night, somehow getting 14 miles away without a vehicle, it just didn't make a lot of sense. So they theorized that she had been suffocated in a way that left no marks, and then after death was thrown into the ditch. Unfortunately, the medical examiner couldn't confirm if she had been suffocated, which is very, very interesting to me. But the medical examiner also couldn't confirm if she had somehow ended up in the stitch and drowned accidentally or if someone had thrown her in there prior to death. It was confusing because there was no water at all in her lungs. And I know we all jumped to the conclusion that that means there's no way someone could have drowned if there's no water in their lungs. But according to the article that I was reading here, it's very possible. I don't know how much I believe that. We've talked about this in multiple different cases before. So if any of you guys have any research studies, anything like that that you can send to me, please do because this is something that bothers me in way too many cases than I feel like it should. Um, but there was no water in her lungs, only water in her nasal passages, which normally means that someone went into the water after death. The medical examiner still said, despite all of this, Everything was consistent with drowning, but the medical examiner also wasn't sure enough to state it as a fact. So the cause of death still remains unknown. At this point, authorities had absolutely no suspects, but they did have a person of interest simply because of the circumstances of the night, and that is Matt. He was the last one to be with her. I'm almost certain it was alone in the apartment, but I can't say that for sure. They could have been with someone else. And he was also the one to find her car. They decided to bring Matt in three separate times for interviews and questioning. And each time he was given a polygraph as well, because at this point he was pretty much all they had. But all three times he passed and showed absolutely no red signs that I know of to authorities that he was responsible of anything. In total, they conducted over 200 interviews hoping someone would know something, but no substantial information was ever found. Authorities to this day believe that the killer didn't know Amanda at all and that this was more so a crime of opportunity. It also seems possible to authorities that whoever did this to Amanda had done this before. So they're thinking there could be potentially a serial killer on their hands. There was not a single sign of struggle in the car, which means that someone had to lure her out without causing any sort of issues. And there are only very few people that could have done this. This person also left no trace in general inside the car and nothing was found around the scene or where her body was found either. And that leads authorities to believe that whoever did this knew what they were doing exactly and cover their tracks very well. But they also believe it's very possible because of the rains, if there had been any evidence on Amanda herself or anywhere near the car or the ditch, it's very possible as well that all of that evidence was just completely washed away. But at this point, there's no way to determine which way the answer goes. The FBI got involved in the case because this was just so baffling and startling to so many people that a young woman could just pull over on the side of the road somehow disappear from her car with no signs of what exactly happened to her. But unfortunately, through their own digging, they weren't able to find any more answers either. The most they could do was come up with a profile of the killer. They believed that at the time of the murder, the suspect was 50 years old and a white male and more than likely lived very, very close to where the body was found. Not necessarily where she was potentially taken or where her car was, but where the body was found. And as much as you would think this would be beneficial, it makes it almost more frustrating in my opinion. There's not a lot near where her body was found. It's all farmland. There are two very small towns about five to 10 minutes away that can't have a population more than like 100 people. And then you have to go 30 minutes or further to get to any of the larger towns. And I'm not saying it's impossible the suspect can't live further away. It's just kind of more of a drive and more out of the way. And this location, the ditch in particular, keep in mind this is 2000, 
you know, maps are very different than what they are now. This person had to have known exactly where this location was. This wasn't somewhere that you would just kind of stumble upon while driving around. You would have had to go off of the main highway. Uh, it's just more likely this person knew exactly where this was, but somehow, despite it being such a low populated area, it didn't lead them any closer to answers. Amanda's parents had their own theories, mainly surrounding her vehicle, and I think it's highly possible what they are suggesting. Growing up, they always taught Amanda that if she was ever pulled over at night, she needed to go to a public area with lots and lots of lighting. She was also very good at protecting herself, so it wasn't like anyone could have managed to get her out of her vehicle in the middle of the night, in the dark, in an area she wasn't very familiar with. Because her car was parked directly under a street light and by other houses, her family believes a police officer or someone impersonating police officer pulled her over, managed to lure her out of the vehicle, leaving no signs of a struggle, somehow tricked her into their car, and then everything else played out. She would not have gotten out of the car for anybody else. Now, I have seen a couple of blogs speak about this and their theories on it, and they say that it could be so much more than a police officer. There are many other people that we would kind of give our trust to in most situations, benefit of the doubt, I guess you could say, like an elderly person or a child or military, just someone that looks like they are in need. We can kind of switch off protection mode and think we need to maybe protect them or trust them. So there could have been many different ways along those lines that she could have been lured out of the car. But because law enforcement was such a huge possibility and easily accessible at the time, all law enforcement in the area were questioned thoroughly, given polygraph tests. Uh, they all passed with flying colors though, not a single one showed any red flags that led any other authorities to believe they could possibly be responsible. At this point, it's been 20 years and the case remains unsolved and I haven't seen much on if it's being investigated anymore. In 2001, Amanda's parents requested that Amanda's case air on Unsolved Mysteries and I guess it started to unfold, but when Unsolved Mysteries reached out to Matt, Matt did not want to do an interview. So everything was rejected. I know about a year later, Matt ended up changing his mind, but he only wanted to do a phone interview and they still wanted an in-person one, so the request was denied yet again, which irritates me, but I understand he was the last person to be there. He was the last person to find the car. Um, I just don't understand why they would totally, you know, throw away potential exposure on a case over a phone interview instead of an in-person one. I don't know, it's weird, but either way, that was a lot of coverage that was lost for her. I struggled a lot with finding very current articles on this, but I do know that as of 2007, Amanda's family was still living in Dell and hoping for justice for their daughter. I know at that time there was also a $10,000 reward being offered. I cannot find if it is still current, but I did want to briefly mention that just in case. The It's obviously not a case where Amanda ran off left willingly and then somehow made it 14 miles away into a water-filled ditch. That's obviously not the case here. It's very obviously just foul play. I know that Matt denying a couple of the interviews threw him under a little bit of speculation. Um, I don't know if he had an alibi for after all this happened. I don't know if there's any chance at all he's involved. I just don't have enough information to make an opinion on that. But there is someone that authorities started looking to, into in 2013, and this is when it starts connecting to Dana Steidum and Annette. So apparently, there was a shooting, I believe possibly an attempted murder, of a woman named Annette Rapaley. Rapaley, I know I'm so pronouncing that wrong. And I will get into her story in next week's video, uh, but something about her case connected to Dana Steidum's murder in 1989. And I guess something from there connected them to Amanda's murder in 2000. And all of the circumstances in these three cases are a little bit similar. I definitely see points that seem to be a pattern. There's also a few things that seem off at the same time, but it's enough connecting information that authorities are looking at this as a huge possibility. And I know for a fact they're still looking into Dana's case, which, you know, in turn could help Amanda's case. But before I kind of throw this off to the side as definitely being connected to Dana's case or Annette's case, the whole reason I separated these two and didn't do them together, even though I possibly could have, was because they each 
are their own case still. And until it's proven they're connected, they need to be treated as if they could possibly not be. And when it comes to Amanda, I don't know what to think. It's very odd to me that she would stumble across, you know, someone that randomly has bad intentions at midnight, one in the morning, in the middle of absolute nowhere farmland. It's very odd to me. So I really, really believe this could be the work of a serial killer. If there was someone with a very specific plan, set in place, a specific location, if they kind of wait in an area long enough and they are really set on what they want to do, I can see how they would stumble across Amanda and it would be a perfect opportunity. But I do also believe that whoever did this was at least someone that she felt she could trust or was able to lure her out because she felt they were in danger, they needed protecting. So again, along the same lines of children, elderly, you know, law enforcement, military, something like that. It seems to me she left the car in a rush. She didn't think to turn the windshield wipers off. She didn't think to turn the radio down or anything because the second that they turned the car on, radio was loud, windshield wipers kept on going. It kind of seems like a quick stop and turn the car off situation. Now, I think about when I would stop to help someone, I don't think I would turn the car off. That's just me personally. Um, if I saw someone was in distress or help, I would literally just like pull over to the side of the road and jump out of the car with it still running. So it makes me think maybe police or authorities or someone was like, you know, you need to get out of the car and she like maybe panicked and quickly turned the car off and like went to stand beside it. While authorities also have stated they don't believe anyone else was in her vehicle, I guess based on the evidence that they found, I'm not 100% set on that either. Something really bothers me about that Coke can still being cold. Again, let's say she stopped at a gas station in Jonesboro because there's not gonna be very many of them along that stretch of highway. That means that that Coke somehow managed to stay cold in the middle of summer from 11.30 to 2.30. I just don't know how much I believe that. And the reason why this really bothers me is because in Dana's case, there was a huge chance someone drove her car around for a little bit after taking her. So that could come into play here and maybe no evidence was just left behind. So let me know what you guys think about Amanda's case in specific. And then next week when I get into Dana's case and also what happened to Annette, we can kind of come together and form an idea or conclusion on what we think about the possibility that these cases are connected. I do know again that authorities at least in Dana's case, are working on these connecting points. But that's all I have for you guys today. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Amanda's story. Please share this wherever you can, especially if you are local. Also, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Helen fam. So hopefully we can bring them home together. And I will see you guys in next week's video. Bye.